This episode of History Saver is brought to you by Addressing Gettysburg. Addressing Gettysburg is a podcast that shares great experiences, quality programs, awesome guests, and is a welcoming community for all who love Gettysburg. So join in with host Matt Callery and find out why Addressing Gettysburg is one of the top rated podcasts online today. You can find them on Apple Podcasts, Stitcher, CastBox, Podbean, Google Podcasts, TuneIn, and on Instagram, Facebook, and of course, right here on YouTube. So check out Addressing Gettysburg today, where history is not boring. Thank you to Addressing Gettysburg for sponsoring this video. You're listening to Addressing Gettysburg. So in this episode of History Saver, we're in a place I have always wanted to come my entire life. And we finally made it here. And uh, I'm almost speechless. But behind me, I'm standing right in front of the Dunker Church here in Antietam. In September 1862, well, this place will become a battleground and would become one of the bloodiest battles in American history right here around this church. And this was the target of federal attacks. And we're going to not only not just give an entire history because we can't really do that, but we're gonna see some of the sites here in this episode around Antietam and talk about some of the firsthand accounts of the soldiers who were actually here. So from somewhere in this angle where I'm standing now, this photograph was taken by Alexander Garner a couple of days after the battle. And we're standing approximately in the area where that photograph was taken. And this area around Dunker Church after the battle, well, this place was turned into an outright cemetery full of dead horses, dead men, cannons broken to pieces. And when the firing started here on September the 17th, an account of one of the guys, one of the soldiers here, said that that artillery shots, the first ones, were hot ones indeed. And he really didn't expect to live through today. Just uh, goes to show you, well, he may not have been wrong. So the dunkers that were here, <laughs> as members of this church were not for war they didn't want war and they had a service here on September the 14th just a few days before the battle started and they could hear the cannon fire from here that was going on South Mountain and the men here who was in this area there's accounts of many of them saying how hot the artillery fire was here at the church 
And one of them said, well, he didn't expect to live through the day. And he didn't. A man by the name of Private J.D. Hicks, Company K, 125th Pennsylvania Volunteers, wrote of being in this area on September the 17th under the dark shade of a towering oak tree near the Dun Dunker Church. Maybe that was the tree he was behind lay the lifeless form of a germer boy apparently not more than 17 years of age flats and hair and eyes of blue in form of delicate mold as i approached him i stooped down and as i did so i perceived a bloody mark upon his forehead it showed where the leading messenger of death had produced a wound and caused his death his lips were compressed his eyes half open a bright smile played upon his countenance by his side lay his tender drum, never to be tapped again. And perhaps that drummer boy was found up underneath the tree behind Dunker Church, or even perhaps to the left of Dunker Church. But somewhere around this church, a 17-year-old boy, or somewhere around that age, lay here lifeless. High and visual to what happened here on September the 17th. Another account here from at Dunker Church by Union, uh, by Charles Carlton Coffin, who is an Army correspondent, said, I recall a Union soldier lying near the Dunker Church with his face turned upward. His pocket Bible was open upon his breast. I lifted the volume and read the words, Though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for thou art me, with me, thy rod and thy staff comfort me, Upon the flyleaf were the words, We hope and pray that you may be permitted by kind providence after the war is over to return. So somewhere around here lay that Union soldier with his Bible upon his chest that the Army correspondent read. And he never made it home. He died here holding that Bible. And it lay upon his breast. So just a couple of accounts from the men who were here describing the rampage and the sights and sounds of battle and the aftermath that was here in this area so here's where general jackson's command was on september 17 62 and also the 15th and 16th 62. so in front of us is the west woods and one soldier from the 35th Massachusetts said that our first fire was a rattling volley. Then came the momentary interval occupied in a loathing. The rifles, of course, muzzle loaders were iron rod, ramrods. The carpenters were new and the brown paper of the toughest description. So that strong fingers were required to tear out the conical ball in a little paper cup of gunpowder. Emptying these into the muzzle and ramming them home and capping the piece took time seemingly a long time in the hurry of action in the midst of battle so this is the philadelphia brigade monument and one soldier of the 125th private mouse c hewitt said we were massed in column by company in the cornfield the night was close air heavy some rainfall the air was perfumed with a mixture of crushed green corn stalks ragweed and clover we made our beds between rows of corn and would not remove our accoutrements and he's talking about the cornfield that's laying just near this monument in front of us we're right here near the near the philadelphia brigade monument and the west woods and if you look right behind me well there's a turned upside down or downward cannon and this is to general william stark confederate general who died here while leading attack into the west woods and he's buried in richmond virginia next to his son who also lost his life in the battle of seven pines so pretty cool to see the position where he fell during the fight here for the west woods pretty neat to see this in person Let's continue on. The West Woods that you see right behind my shoulder here was where some of the most fierce fighting took place. 
And what we have here is some monuments to the Philadelphia Brigade. And we have some literature here kind of highlighting that during the fighting in this West Woods, the Philadelphia Brigade, commanded by General Otis Howard, lost more than 550 men in just 20 minutes of combat. 30 years later, the association purchased 11 acres for their monument, and that's right here. And their monument is over 70 foot tall. And it is the tallest monument on the battlefield commemorating the 20 minutes of fighting that cost the lives of over 500 men in the woods you see right in front of me. So this is their monument here in Antietam and the largest on the battlefield. All right, as you can see, it is pretty hot where I'm at right now, but we are in the cornfield, right in the middle of the cornfield, quite literally, here at Antietam. And I want to read an account from someone that was actually here and his account of what happened here this day. And I wanted to do it from this cornfield. Major General Joseph Hooker, some of you guys may know him, said this about his time here in this cornfield. In the time that I'm writing, every stalk of corn in the northern and greater part of the field was cut as closely as could have been done with a knife. And the slain lay in rows, precisely as they had stood in their ranks a few moments before. It was never to my fortune to witness a more bloody, dismal battlefield. Those are the words that Hooker described this cornfield as. And just standing here, man, is, is surreal to me. We're actually in the cornfield of Antito. Crazy. So the scene you're seeing right now, throughout the morning of the battle, fighting raged here along the Hagerstown Turnpike. At one point of the fighting, Union and the Confederate forces found themselves just yards away from one another on opposite sides of this road that you see here. Afterward, commander of the 6th Wisconsin Infantry, Major Rufus Dawes, remembered that the piles of dead on the Sharpsburg and Hagerstown Turnpike in this exact location surpassed anything on any other battlefield of his observation. My feeling was that Antietam Turnpike surpassed all in the manifest evidence of slaughter. Photographer Alexander Gardner described these broken bodies as dead Confederates in this photo that's taken in this exact location. And we're going to go to that exact location where he took these photos right now. So in this exact location, Alexander Gardner took this photograph of the Confederate dead. So we're right here behind the Miller's farmhouse and we can't go across here, but somewhere in this location that you see directly in front of me was a photo that was taken during the aftermath of the battle and it was of dead confederates by a union burial out of all the men who died here in antietam out of 5200 men that entered the west woods that you see in the wood line in our distance 2000 fell between the cornfield and the woods itself the north woods 10,000 men fell so pretty cool real uh Wish I could get up there to take the before and after, but it was somewhere in this approximate location, I believe, could be wrong, but I do believe that this was taken. 
So I am shooting this in a hurry because there is a highway and we are in a car in a hurry. But in 1884, there was a famous photograph taken here at Nicodemus Heights. And it's a exact location. And you can see these trees that are still standing there in this photograph. I just thought it was pretty cool. This was a big portion of the Confederate artillery positions here during the Battle of Antietam. So where we are right now is... A pretty cool spot on the battlefield. This is the monument to Clara Barton, the angel of the battlefield. And through her accounts and writings on here at the Antietam battlefield, she said, a man lying upon the ground asked for a drink. I stooped to give it. And having raised him on my right hand, was holding the cup to his lips on my left when I felt a sudden twitch of the loose sleeve on my dress. The poor fellow sprang from my hands and fell back quivering in agonies of death. A ball had passed between my body and the right arm which supported him, cutting through the sleeve, passing through his chest from shoulder to shoulder. So he died as she's somewhere in this general vicinity, giving him his last drink of water, trying to comfort him. And even in those moments, well, he, he was shot with another bullet and that tells you just how dangerous it was for her herself on this battlefield men are getting shot as she's trying to care for them and the small cross you see on the base of this monument was taken from her new uh, north oxford massachusetts home on christmas day and was placed inside of this monument as a memorial to claire barton well, apparently, even the birds here in Antietam want to tour the battlefield, too. You see a bird admiring a statue on top of his head. Or maybe he just has a take a dookie. So we've come to the portion of the East Woods here on the battlefield in Antietam. And Charles Carlton Coffin... A Army correspondent says, I recall a soldier with a cartridge between his thumb and finger. The end of the cartridge was bitten off and paper between his teeth when a bullet pierced his heart. In the machinery of life, all the muscles and nerves had come to a standstill. So when Alexander Garner come here just days after the battle to take photos, he took a photo in this exact spot of this exact tree and boulder of a burial crew for the Union Army sitting here taking a break and that photo is a very famous photograph that is now often shown with the photos of the Battle of Antietam and we're standing at probably the exact same spot that he did when he took that photo Also somewhere around this general vicinity where Alexander Gardner's photo was taken, Private David L. Thompson of Company G. Knight, New York Volunteers, said this, All were calling for water, of course, but none was to be had. We lay there until dusk, perhaps an hour when the fighting ceased. During that hour, the bullet snipped the leaves from a young locust tree growing at the edge of a hollow and pondered us with fragments. We had time to speculate on many things, among others the impatience of which men clamor in dull times to be led into a fight. Sergeant Jacob Freiberger, Company K, 51st Pennsylvania Infantry, said, I have seen more than I ever expected to see. I have laid on the field in front of the enemy where the dead and wounding were lying in heaps around us. And he's describing the carnage in this particular area we are in now. And you can see Dunker Church in the distance. Private David L. Thompson, Company G, Knight New York Volunteers. Before the sunlight faded, I walked the narrow field. 
All around lay Confederate dead, clad in butternut. As I looked down on the poor pinch faces, all anemone died out. There was no secession in those rigid forms, nor in those fixed eyes staring at the sky. Clearly, this was not their war. All right, so we have made it to the cornfield itself, the area overlooking the cornfield. And this is perhaps one of the most terrible areas on the battlefield. Union soldiers stepped out of the cornfield in front of us. At dawn of September 17, 1862, Confederate troops aligned in the fields just behind us in this area. So these are where all the Confederates were. And for the next four hours, this cornfield was the center of storm, lead, and flame as Federal soldiers of the 1st and 12th Corps clashed with Lee's men directly to our front. The cornfield exchanged hands again and again and again as both sides continuously attacked and counterattacked. One soldier remembered that the air here seemed to be full of leaden missiles. Rifles were shot to pieces in the hands of soldiers, canteens and haversacks riddled with bullets and the dead and wounded went down in scores. Another soldier recalled that his horse that he was riding upon was hit and in the instant it was hit it was blown basically to smithereens and he was unharmed. General John Bell Hood wrote that it was here I witnessed the most terrible clash of arms by far that has occurred during this entire war. Every stalk of this corn in the northern and greater part of the field was cut as closely to the ground as could have been done with a knife and the slain lay in rows precisely where they stood in their ranks a few moments before. I was never in my ever fortune to witness a more bloody, dismal field. Private James Daltrey of the 128th recalled through a shower of bullets and shells, it was only the thoughts of home that bought me from that place. Another soldier also recalled from a Pennsylvania brigade that as he lay here, he was scared if he lifted his head, he would be shot immediately. His friend next to him lifted his head. He didn't make it home. He was shot through the eyes. This is the scene that played out in the cornfield in Antietam. When we visit, visit these battlefields, we often forget those tales of the first-hand accounts of the men who actually were here. We get so caught up in tactics and maneuvers and the battle lines, and I'm guilty of that. This is the first video I've actually solely forgotten about the tactics and maneuvers and focus on more of the men's accounts and read some of the men's accounts, even if not from the place that they were necessarily at during the battle, I'm near that place. And behind me, you can see some of the monuments to the Confederate uh, men and their brigades and divisions that was here. General Stonewall Jackson's men were in this area. And it's these accounts we need to remember to carry us home and not forget of places like this. All right, so we've made our way to the Mama Farm here on the battlefield of Antietam. And before the battle, the Mamas was a family who was here and a couple of days before the battle, as they were living here right across from their church, Dunker Church, they invited families to come to their farm, spend an afternoon. And they were, of course, talking and worried about the invasion coming their way. Well, it did. They packed their belongings, their belongings up, they left, 
and the Confederates made their way here. Well, scared that the Union Army would capture this place and use it for an excellent vantage point for artillery, they decided to burn the home. They threw a torch into a bedroom window, onto the bed, starting to quilt on fire, burnt their house down. A Union artillery shell leveled the barn of the home. The mamas was not reimbursed for what happened at their home. Instead, they were sent a letter of apology from John Clark, one of the Confederates who burnt their home. So, pretty neat little history behind the mama farm here in Antietam. As we make our way through the little path here, this is known as the Mama Cemetery. No, there's no veterans buried here, but instead, these are families that lived in the area. All right, so behind me you see the Bloody Lane, Sunken Lane, the most favorite portion of this entire, or the most famous portion of this entire battlefield. Alexander Gardner took photos here in this spot just days after the battle of this sunken lane filled with the bodies of Union soldiers of the Irish Brigade. Pretty cool to see this in person. This is a place I've wanted to see my entire life. So to be standing here is kind of surreal. What we're going to do now is probably something I really don't want to do, but we're going to do it anyway. We're going to the top of this massive behemoth to get a better look of the Irish Brigade's position here in Antietam along the Bloody Lane. And, well, let's, uh, <laughs> let's make our way up here. Speaking of the Irish Brigade here at Antietam, here's their memorial. Brigade General Thomas Francis Meagers, Irish Brigade, is right here in this position along the Bloody Lane. And it gives their entire history of the unit where they fought and right here all right so i've made it to the top and holy bananas dude this is incredible <laughs> it is uh overlooking the entire battlefield here at Antietam and as you stand here you really get a bird's eye view for what was going on here during the battle right behind me was the middle bridge the signal station about two miles that way Crampton's Gap just a few miles Frederick Maryland just a few miles this way the upper bridge about 3,000 yards. Prize Ford, about 2,200 yards. And then, as we make our way here, you see the bloody cornfield, Dunker Church, and then you see the bloody lane. This is probably perhaps the most incredible view of any battlefield in the entire country and you can stand up here and imagine the sights the sounds of September the 17th 1862 on all the fields you see around us of what was going on pretty incredible all right so right now we are going to a spot that I've wanted to see my entire life since I was nine years old and today well that dream is becoming a reality as we're visiting Burnside's Bridge in Antietam
right, so this is Burnside's Bridge here in Antietam. And on September the 17th, 1862, Confederates, Georgians, on this side of the bridge in this tree line, or excuse me, ridge line, was firing down on Union Ninth Corps soldiers as they crossed this real little bitty narrow space of a bridge. And you can just imagine the sights, the sounds, the horror as Union guys attacked over this little bitty bridge to try to get to the other side. And Georgia troops would just cut them down piece by piece as they come across. It's quiet, it's serene here now. But on the afternoon of September 1862, this small peaceful bridge here in Antietam, along Antietam Creek, was an immortal hell. And you can stand here and just imagine the musket fire, the, the rounds, the wall of lead coming in on this bridge as these Union soldiers attacked across this bridge. And that tree stood testament to every ounce of it and is still here today. You know, I stand here and I'm watching birds, you know, fly through the bridge, up under the bridge, over the water. And you can't help but think about the hell that took place here on September the 17th, 1862. And this tree that we're standing in front of saw everything. You can imagine the gunfire, the muskets that's trained on this bridge as the Union soldiers advanced over the bridge directly to our front again and again. And the Confederates on the other side on that ridge line overlooking this bridge, sweeping their gunfire down upon them in the hell of lead. It's quiet now, but on that day in September, it wasn't quiet. And this is a place I've wanted to see since I was a kid. It's surreal to be standing here. So what you're looking at right now is a site I've waited almost my entire life to look at. And that's matching up an, an original photograph with this photograph right here. This is something I've waited since I was a kid to do. And this tree saw it all. It saw the Union Army attacking across this bridge. The Confederates on the high ground in front of this bridge cutting down Union troops as they attacked over Burnside's Bridge as what we call it now. And this is the Burnside Sycamore that saw everything. To be standing in the spot I'm standing right now It's a, I'm shaking because it's a place I've wanted to see since I was a kid. Um, you know, it's kind of dumb, but, you know, when you read about a place, you see the images of a place and you know the whole history behind it. And if think about the Union Army attacking over this bridge, the Confederates on the other side, uh, Georgia men, you know, shooting them down as they crossed the bridge. This is a place I never knew if I'll be standing in or not. And uh, you guys have helped make that re a reality through this channel. And uh, I can't thank you enough. Yeah, it's pretty cool. So I want to thank you guys for tuning into this episode. And uh, keep preserving history. And come visit cool places like this for yourself. Because it's definitely worth it. So come here, visit this place, because I guarantee you, you won't be sorry. If you don't come to any other part of the battlefield here at Antietam, come here. Until next time, keep preserving history. Stay safe. We'll see you soon. Don't forget to check out the History Underground, Project Past, Vlogging Through History, Adams County Historical Society, American Battlefield Trust, and there's numerous others I haven't named. But uh, yeah, come, come visit this place. Let's get out of here.